Hey guys, this is Brett Young, Taylor Young, and Rod Erb, and you're tuned in to the Be Extraordinary Podcast with Urban Young. Real conversations about business, leadership, and personal development. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Be Extraordinary Podcast. Have you ever thought to yourself, should I buy an existing business? Maybe you're running, you're gunning, you've been in business a year, two years, three years, and an opportunity comes along for you to purchase another business in your space. That has happened to Rod Taylor and myself five times, I think, now at this point. They will correct me if I'm wrong. And there have been some really key things that we've learned through these purchases alongside of growing our business organically. But some of the questions that we get a lot are, should I buy another existing business? Am I better off just growing organically? Am I ready to do this? What is a good deal look like? How do I know if I'm paying too much? Today in this episode, we're going to dive deep into all of these subjects, into these questions, and hopefully by the end of this 30, 45 minutes, however long we go, you will feel equipped to know if buying a business is right for you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Been a minute. Has been a minute, man. Excited. We've uh, we've got some really good guests that are coming up on the show. We've got some exciting things, but today we get to rip it just the three of us. So I wanted to kick this off to you guys um, and make sure that I was correct. Has it been five acquisitions at this point since we started? I mean, if, if we've looked at dozens, right? Yeah. But I feel like we've executed five. Yeah, and I think, yeah, dozens is right. I, I would think we'd probably looked at anywhere from 50 to 75 different deals over the last decade and a half. Yep. Um, I think I think the answer is five. Okay. And they've been all different shapes and sizes, which has been fun. Some of them been bank bank owned. Um, some of them are retiring. Yeah. Uh, some of them are roll-ins. Some some of you keep locations. So it's it's been a broad experience. I feel like that, we've, that's we've run fun. the gamut. Yeah, yeah. So far, on just even though even with five, we've seen we've seen five very different different scenarios. And what's <clears> the what's the total revenue from those five? You guys would say. Yeah, I'm doing some quick math yeah. in my head right now. Um, probably close to two million That's what in I was revenue. Say just under two was going to be my guess. Okay, two million. And then what's the biggest deal that we've done, and what's the smallest deal that we've done? Biggest was what? Eight hundred. Eight hundred in revenue. Smallest um, was small. Small. It was yeah. sixty in revenue. Yeah. yeah. So eight hundred thousand plus on the high side, sixty thousand on the low side. All shapes and sizes, one-man operators, uh, agency with a team, uh, market away from the mothership that wasn't close. Um, some of them where the owner rides off at the sunset, we never talk to him again. Some of them we have great relationships, uh, and we still talk to him to this day. Some of them came with a, an office space. Some of them were virtual. So uh, I just want to give the listeners some context before we go into this, because I will say I, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't do well, but I will say we've done a lot of things the wrong way, and I feel like we've gotten pretty good at this one. So hopefully we can answer some of these questions. Um uh, that I spoke about today. So I wanted to kick it off with you guys in regards to just valuations. I know sometimes a lot of, uh, not, not sometimes, a lot of times I get the question of like, hey, wait, is this fair? What should I, you know, if I'm selling my business, uh, let's just take the insurance business. I know that there's other people that are listening to this that are in different industries, but today we're going to give specific to the insurance agency model because that's what we know. However, I will say you business is business. They're, they're, you know, the valuations may differ, but the principles guiding mm. those do not change, didn't matter the industry. But let's stick with insurance since that's what we know. When you're looking at valuations, what are some of the ways that we value or that you've seen other people valuate agencies? Um, so you can kind of get a ballpark in regards to what something should cost uh, and how you would look at it in regards to what is an, an optimal fair, you know, range. Yeah, I think when we first started, uh, uh, a lot of people in the insurance business specifically just use um, revenue multiples. And then, you know, kind of the pros uh, on the, you know, the big boxes, the hubs, et cetera. Uh, these PE firms all use EBITDA, which is just free cash, net, net cash flow. So kind of what's what's lev left over after expenses uh, in the current asset. And, and that creates a, uh, a multiple. So, yeah, so really a top line revenue multiple versus – uh, a free cash uh, multiple. Yeah, and I'd even I'd even challenge that a little bit to say I, I'd put it in three different categories because you know there's there's free cash, but then EBITDA, it, it, you know, you've got interest expense that's in there that's taken out. So when you're looking at an EBITDA 
multiple, you know, someone could have a significant amount of debt and that interest expense is, uh, you know, and the amortization for on the PL is wiped away. Mm-hmm. So someone might have, you could take a big business that's got $300,000 in interest and amortization expense on their, on their PL. And, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't account into the, the, the baseline of what that EBITDA number is, right? It's almost like we wipe that away and say, okay, well, that's good debt. Let's not include that. And then we get a number, and then that's based on, on a revenue. And then you have, right, what you said, free cash, which is how much money is left over. At the end of the day, how much, how much net? How much, how much net? At the, at the, how much owner benefit is another way to say it. Um, I know we bought... Uh, the biggest one uh, was based off of free cash, right. which was, but what's interesting about that is the boogeyman there is you might have uh, an owner who's running a lot of personal expenses uh, or they might be running a business really lean. There's some different dynamics there that don't necessarily, uh, that they could be padding the bottom line, getting ready for a sale. And you know, when you come in here to optimally manage this business, you're not going to be able to run it the same way that they're running it. So why don't we go through those three, if you will. So multiple, top line multiple, meaning I've got a revenue number and it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a multiplication factor. Am I doing one X, two X or three X? In our business, we can get up to three X. Sometimes it can be higher than that. And then uh, you have EBITDA, which we have multiples of EBITDA. And then we have uh, free cash, net free cash. So how much, how much cash flow is this every single year? How much at the end of the, at the end of the day is left over? Let's walk through kind of the pros and cons of each one of those, if you could maybe give you some context on that. Yeah, I think the when you share that, it, I think all are important. I think they're all factors that you're looking at to assess valuation. You know, I, I don't think one way is, um, I think when you're acquiring the smaller ones, it's just simple math on the, the top line number. I think most agency owners are tra- trained to think in multiples of revenue. Um, and so you can get to the math quicker and then back into the other math and I think it goes into, say, our filter, because all we're sharing today is really our filter when we look at an acquisition and what it's been in the past. Um, and all of those tell a different story of how the asset's going to perform once you come in to the picture. Um, so obviously the pros of the multiple on revenue is it's very simple. It's very you know easy. What's your revenue? Here's an approximate multiple. Let's see if we're in the same ballpark and if we can move on. When you get into the EBITDA and the debt and all that stuff that you shared, that's more of an accounting standpoint of, you know, your books, your P&L, everything like that, how it's going to affect. And then obviously the net free cash is going to be, hey, what am I left over to play with um, to actually grow this thing? And I think our filter has been so much based around what are we going to do to grow this thing? So I th- one thing I think about when you're judging a valuation of a business, I've always thought, what is, what is it worth to the buyer? Like, I don't think it's the same from buyer to buyer. Yes. It depends on what you're going to do with that asset. Yes. How does it fit in strategically? One thing that is a part of our filter is outside of the financial, outside of the financials, what is the strategic reason that you're buying this asset? That's one thing that all five that we've done, there was always a strategic reason that regardless of the quote unquote deal, because everyone wants to get a deal, right? Like, oh, we want to get a great deal. Uh, Go ahead. No, that was, uh, that was the one thing I was going to say. And I, I, I just remember so vividly, you know, hearing you talk and it been in different negotiations, it's like there's good deals, there's bad deals, and there's fair deals, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm looking for a good deal, that means someone's going to get a bad deal. Amen. Right? Mm-hmm. If I'm look, but if I'm, but if I set out to to have to make a fair deal, mm-hmm. then in theory both people win, right? So I I think that's important to point out when you start talking about value, valuation. I think it's almost a precursor to what we may get to different methods, we may get to the valuation different ways, but let's make it very clear that we want a fair deal, right? Yeah. So I, I just, I didn't mean to jump you, but I just, I'm, I'm reminded of that. And I mean, I just, the, the, this latest one, that was very, very top yeah, of mind. You, you, do you want to get the best of the transaction or do you want multiple deals behind this, right? Reputation and treating people with respect. And you know, this is somebody's livelihood that they've spent right. their entire life building. You know, like I, nobody wants to, nobody wants to, I, I don't, well, I shouldn't say nobody. A lot of people do, but I don't know. We certainly want to walk away feeling that we've honored the person that, you know, we're, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we've been, uh, have the opportunity to take the business and, 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 and hopefully grow it. But well, let me come back to that, Taylor, because I think there's two that you make a great point. I think that is quick math, quick and dirty. It's easy. And then almost like you use the other factors just to make sure that it's still valid. Right. Mm -hmm. I think there's two, I think there's two different buyers. 
And I think it depends on what, I think the valuation depends on the buyer. And here's why I said that. And I, you're totally right. It depends. The, not all businesses are equal to each party, right? That's why some people pay astronomically amounts of money for this. And you're like, how could they possibly pay for it? Yeah, it's Amazon like, for Whole Foods or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's strategic reason. Yeah, they know something that in. you don't know. Yeah. You know, it's like Whole Facebook for Instagram, you know, you name it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so I look at it like if it's top line of revenue, I look at somebody's not really concerned about the operations. They're not concerned about profitability. They're just for, they're going to take that revenue and they're going to either fold it into their ops or they're going to optimize it because they know exactly what type of margins they're going to get because they're going to insert their playbook, right? If somebody's buying ex an existing business and is going to take the actual business for the business, yeah. Yeah. then they're going to care a lot more about free cash. Amen. They're going to care yeah, a lot more about the EBITDA. They're going to care a lot more about the earnings of the business because that is in practical form how how well the business is running. I think a lot of times in the agency space when a lot of these M&A deals happen, top line revenue makes a lot of sense because most of the time they're not necessarily taking over the office. They're not necessarily taking over the operations. Um, I think it's a lot of these, we have done that because I think that's important to the agency owner. And so when you do that, it's important because, you know, if you're taking over expenses, you want to make sure that you're buying a business that's actually going to turn a profit. But I think that is determinant on the buyer in regards to, you know, am I going to just fold in this revenue? Or am I going to actually assume the actual ops of the business? I think that's two distinctions. That was going to be my comment. It's just, you know, what is it an asset purchase or is it a business? Are you purchasing the whole business? Because I felt like... Mm, that's I've a big deal. That's two. Yeah, yeah, great. I've always felt like if it's an asset only purchase, let's take top line. We can verify that real quick and we can get to a number. Yep. Certainly simple, certainly quicker, but it's like we're just buying the asset. Like it's like, I don't care about, you know, your coffee machine and the expense of, you know, your your office cleaning, all that stuff. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, think I just feel like the deeper you get in or maybe sometimes the bigger the book, right? Yes. Or the bigger, the bigger the book, you want the business that goes with it because there's people that run the business. Yes. So there's just more factors that would indicate, you know, how you come in and how it all translates into the profitability. But you're going to, I think then you're going to start talking about different, different methods of valuation. To me, it seems like it's just a simple thing if it's going to be an asset purchase. It's great. Yeah, and there's also, you know, you talk about, yeah. Over negotiation, I always think about this. You know, you, I, I just go back to what you said. You have you know, you a good deal versus a fair deal. And I feel like a lot of times when people are going to sell, uh, what's the hardest part about these deals? It's to get them. <laughs> Let's call yeah. it like it is. It's to be able to have them, the yeah. access to talk to an agency owner before the masses are in on it. And, you know, a lot of times that's what the agency owner wants too, right? Because they have a staff, they have a reputation, and a lot of times, whether it's retirement, um, you know, th there's something that comes up in life that goes, hey, I want to sell. And I don't necessarily, this is not going to be a three-year process, a two-year process. I'd really like this to be a 90, to, 90 days to six-month process. Mm -hmm. And so the over-negotiation can sometimes be a lose-lose for both parties. You know, you get lost in analysis. You're running all three phases. You're so focused on a good deal um, and, and they're exhausted by the process. You're asking for loss ratios and performance and all these things that are important in execution, but they exhaust the yes. seller yeah. and they exhaust the buyer. So I, I always like to don't over -negoti negotiate. Let's get close enough on a conceptual on a conceptual pricing, and then let's work into the details after that. Let's throw in an inspection period that's yep. fair that we can get our hands on financials and we can run our numbers. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted good to share thought. that piece. Those are great yeah. thoughts. Great right thought. There. Yeah. I want to recap a couple of things because those are really good real quick. So valuations wise, you have an asset purchase and you have uh, a business purchase. I think in the asset purchase, you know, look, you're just, you're just purchasing the revenue. It's going to be usually a multiple. That makes sense. If you're purchasing the business itself, I think net free cash or EBITDA is going to be a much better way to value it how you want to buy that business. And just so the listeners at home, uh, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. But I think that's a great place to start. Am I buying this business because I'm going to take over the business or am I buying it because it's going to add revenue to my existing operations? And that's going to determine where you want to sit as far as the valuation. And then also, Taylor, that's a good point. The valuation is going to be distinctly predicated off of what it's worth to you. 
If you have a buyer that you're competing with and they're willing to pay more than you are, walk away from the deal. There's always somebody willing to pay more and there's always somebody willing to pay less. You've got to find the deal where the value fits where you're willing to pay. Secondly, should I buy an existing business? You have a lot of people that are listening to this that have a practice. They, um, they're growing their business. Uh, they, they have an agency. They're growing their agency. And the idea and the thought of doing a you know, purchase is scary. You know, they've heard the horror stories of the skeletons that you purchase and the distraction. And, you know, there's kind of this way of like, hey, should I should I buy or should I just continue to do what I'm doing? Should I take this extra money maybe that I have and put it into an acquisition or should I put it into more marketing or more staff? And so maybe talk to me about the seasons of the business that we were in where it made sense and maybe the seasons of the business where it didn't make sense for the listener that's listening to this to say, hey, is this a good fit for me at this time of my cycle? That is a great place to start. You want to take that one? Well, I, I have thoughts. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, 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 my, I was going to make more of a, a kind of a funny there, but go ahead. Yeah, I, you mentioned the season you're in. I, I'm so glad you said that. You know, if you're listening to this, what season are you in, right? I, I remember... Um, you know, our first acquisition, we essentially cut our teeth on kind of how to do this. Right. And we didn't even have a credit card at that point, nor had we ever borrowed money. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And we had taken a playbook um, from one of the largest uh, agencies in the country. And concept, we had been looking at books of business, we had been thinking about this playbook of knowing what to do and what makes sense and how we're going to execute. And then we got this opportunity uh, we started putting feelers out that, hey, if you find anybody that's selling, you know, hey, we'd love to have that conversation. And we, we get our first crack at the bat. We get a small book. We get private financing. We customize the terms based upon the playbook uh, with the private lender, based upon the playbook that we were aware of, right? And we run that playbook on a very small number in comparison, but it was incredible experience on what comes up during these acquisitions because mm -hmm. our lender now always says the risk isn't in the purchase, the risk is in the execution of the purchase. And so when you say what season in, have you done this before? You know? And so for us, if our first crack at the bat was a multi-million dollar agency, that would have been a level of risk that would probably been too much for us. Um, and so we warmed up to that. Our second purchase was our biggest purchase. Um, and it was the same size we were, so it doubled our business overnight. But we felt like we had done it before, and we knew a lot. So, so, so real quick, give, give, sixty thousand was the first sixty thousand revenue. revenue. Yeah. Fairly small comparatively to where we were. One man operation. I think we roll were, in. Yeah, yep. well, I mean, I don't even know how big we were at that point. I don't know, seven hundred thousand, something like that. Oh uh, yeah, less. I, I mean, was going to say six hundred, a couple hundred, couple yeah. hundred thousand yeah. in revenue yeah. or something. Okay, like that. so so fairly small comparatively, but it felt. Large. Massive. Yeah. It felt because you just you just don't know what you're doing. Well, and I, I think I think back to your and question. And then the second too, one was about well, before you go to the second uh -huh. though. It's like the first one. It's like why do we want to buy this, right? We 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 realized I think when you talk about that playbook and that journey, we realized we could buy revenue for different reasons. You talk about should I spend the money I have to market, mm -hmm. or can I buy revenue that's already been spent marketing on, right? So for us, I think it was an it was a little bit of both, right? It was like we can grow our business. All we need is cash. To be able to do it, we didn't have it. We found a private private finance situation, mm -hmm. but it immediately added revenue, which allowed us to pour gas on what we already knew was a work model that was working, mm. which is what we used the money for. Which we'll come back to that. Right? It's really we, good. We, but I guess what I'm getting at is we didn't say, well, let's add revenue so we could take more money, yep. which I think is important, right? When you're talking about the season you're in, and am I ready to buy a business? Should I buy a business? Why would you want to buy a business? Right? We didn't buy a business to increase our revenue so that we can take more as partners and owners. So then maybe that's, that's the start is, is to say, why do you want to purchase a business? Should I purchase a business? Well, then they come back to, well, why, why do you want to purchase a business? Yep. And I think there's a couple of reasons there. One, um, maybe you do want to take more money. Hey, look, you know, I just don't have enough space. If I could do this, I could deploy some cash, make some more money. I could take some more. I think that's a fair, some people could do that. I don't, we didn't agree with that. Right. We didn't do that. <clears throat> I think that's detrimental to future growth. Or you might say, I just, you know, uh, I'm not going fast enough. This is a way for me to expedite my progress. Um, or you might say, I'm at a plateau. You know, I'm not growing at all. And this would be a way that I could grow. Um, there might be a couple of reasons, but I think that's a good place to start is why are you, why are you starting to do, why do you want to do it? Yeah, and I think all those answers are okay. You know, remove the judgment and know what season you're in because we've had an operator that bought a business because he was making a certain income and he needed to make something close to that income to support his family. 
we were not in that position. We were kind of the starving artists that were growing this thing organically, living off 30, 40 grand a year for four years with, you know, scratching and clawing. So we didn't have that, but we had no debt. We were very lean, right? So it's different situations for everyone, but all things to consider. Uh, why we purchased the business at that point is to one of the challenging parts about the PNC business is that, say, if you hire somebody, you're shelling out money as an investment, and then it's taken you a year or two, sometimes for some agencies, three years to recruit that investment. Yeah. Um, it's, the, it's the gift and the curse of our business that we love and we hate. And so if you're doing an acquisition, you can generate, it's one of the few assets, I shouldn't say few, I know there are many out there, but it is one asset that cash flows immediately, most times, right? And so if you can cash flow immediately, what does that give you? That gives you cash to be able to pour into organic growth and so it allows you to shell out that money without having to come out of pocket to be able to ultimately get that return. So let's do a distinction here because that's a f that's such a good point. But but see, because I would just say, well, yeah, but Taylor, you had to you had to let go. You already had cash. You had to let go of cash in order to pay the down payment for this business. So if you're buying the business mm -hmm. for cash, but you had to get rid of cash to get it, what's the advantage of having the asset versus just having the cash that you already had in your bank? Well, I will say you know, a couple different deals, a couple of different ways. There are ways that you can finance the entire thing though. And so, but regardless, if you do put a down payment, you're trading that cash for a return and you're weighing, can I put that cash to work and get X return in this way, organic by itself, or can I put that cash to work with an acquisition and organic and what does that return look like? Well, and I don't think I don't think you're trading one for the other too, because what you also gain is you gain that equity, right? So it's like you trade one, you trade down payment for cash, for cash. In theory, you're going to look at it, it's going to be cash flow because it's going to be surplus, right? But at the same time, it's the, they're they're not equal. There's a surplus of cash, but also that equity piece, you know, which I think is maybe you'll get into that. But I mean, it's like that that's something that I think is quickly forgotten in these acquisition early on acquisition points, at least they were for me. Yeah. At least they were for me. That was, that was, it took me a while. And I'll just say this of the three of us, I'm the least sophisticated with this part of our business learning at a rapid pace. But now you look at it and you understand it. It's like the equity piece. It's like, man, that's, you know, that really, yeah. that really resonates. Yeah, if you put that on the shelf, you know, I look at it like, and Tay, you hit it on the head as far as return. I think the way I look at it in my head is I have cash, which is retained earnings. Okay. Every month I've retained some money. I've retained money at savings, right? I run a business. I save some money. I'm accumulating some cash to do something with it, but I'm going to trade that cash, that lump sum of cash for more cash flow. Mm -hmm. To me, cash flow is infinitely more important than a pile of money. So I will trade a pile of money for more cash flow, which is just monthly cash on cash return, right? How much am I making every month in net profit? Like not even, not even, not even operating profit, but pure cash flow. That is way more valuable to a bank, to an investor, to a buyer, to you as an operator, than you're sitting on a bunch of money, right? Because that money, we can get into the economics of that, but that money's losing money all the time. You need to put it in work. So you're going to put it a CD in the bank so it sits there and gives you a return, or you're going to go buy an asset with it and it gives you more cash flow. So to me, I look at it and go, in, in your season of, of your business, if you've accumulated a little bit of money and you're looking to go, okay, what's the next deal? I would love, I love it because we, I tr we trade that pile of money for more cash flow every month. Then I can use that cash flow to redeploy it back into the business. And to answer you, to come back to that, Taylor, I would much rather use cash flow to purchase more offense than use my pile of money. Mm -hmm. Because that cash flow keeps coming in every single month. It's an infinite flow of money. The, ca the, the pile of cash, it, it has diminishing returns. At some point, it's going to go to zero, right? So for me, that, that, that's where I look at and go, where, where are you at? If you haven't built up enough of retained earnings yet, and you don't have the cash yet, I would say you're probably not ready to buy an asset unless there's some other strategic region and you can't finance the whole thing. But usually, you know, build up some money, build up some cash and then go, okay, how do I turn this cash into more cash flow? And I think that's a very distinct point in somebody's life cycle where they go, okay, I'm ready to make a purchase. Oh, that's, that's the misconception of saving for retirement. You think that you're saving a pile of money to use that pile of money. But in reality, you're spending that pile of money to 
you're trading it for future cash flow, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I look at it the same way as say you would look at retirement with the lens that we're not just piling the money to live off the money. We're piling the money to deploy it to buy future cash flow. Very same, same concept. Absolutely. And then you can get into return and, you know, opportunity cost of where you want to put the money to get the return, but take that and throw it out the window. Just the concept of, you know, I've got a, I've got savings here and I need to do something with it. Purchasing and here, here's what's beautiful about buying an asset in your own business. You can, you can, you can, in, you can influence the outcome. You can influence the return. You're going to get, we have gotten insane returns on our money because we run a good business. I, if I give that to an asset manager in a different class, I, I give up control. I have no influence on that. If you're a bad operator, well, then you have, you're going to have bad influence on that return. But if you run a good business, you can get, you can get 20, 25, 30% returns on your money. I mean, the week, that's what, I mean, we're, you can get significant returns that people don't talk about because you run a good business. So it's an optimal way to truly grow. Real, real quick, guys, let me go to this next question I have for both of you, because this is a hot topic. This comes down to, uh, you know, what season you're in and, and am I ready to purchase a business? Talk to me about organic versus purchase, right? Like, what should I do? Like, is it make more sense for me to go the organic route or does it make more sense for me to purchase? How do you make that determination? How do you know that? Is there some sort of science behind that? Is that a gut feeling? And then what are some of the pros and cons of each one? And, and are they binary? They're not binary. So I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think you, the way we've looked at it, I should say, is that you purchase for organic growth, right? The, the, the purchase is fuel to the organic growth. And that's always been, when you talk about 20, 30, 40% returns on some of these deals, it's basically, you know, we even committed to, talk about threats as an agency owner too, right? When you are investing and you create more cash flow, there's some people that go, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take more income. Mm -hmm. Or I'm, right, because I've just spent money, whatever it is. There's this lifestyle creep that comes in. Or the discipline to go every single dime of that free cash flow. I am going to spend towards organic growth. And if I can spend every dime towards organic growth, well, then I'm going to create more. Yeah. To increase my right? return. Yep. And so and so then once you do that, okay, eventually you get to the point where a couple years later, it's no problem. You can, right. you know, you've paid down the debt, you've increased more cash flow. Okay, perfect. Now you can take more. Yeah, I just so. think too, it's, it's like, it's, it's the culture of or, right? It's and or or, right? I mean, we've seen examples of that in, in our business all over the place. I can either service or I can round. Well, no, you can do both, right? So it's like, I, I think the point, and I, I love the way you lay that out. It's like, we've done both. We've made it a point to make sure that organic growth happens as a result of acquisition. Yeah. I just put a note, you know, like this is that conversation. Someone says, well, yeah, but you're redeploying the cash. So is that really a return? You know, if you're not taking the money, is that really a return on, on your asset? And, and that's where I go, well, the way that we look at it is, well, yeah, but you have to take the equity piece into account, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm, if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm measuring what my go. equity is yeah. Still a and I redeploy that cash flow back into offense and I can create even more lift well, I'm looking at, okay, yeah, you have cash on cash return, but you also have how much am I increasing the valuation of the business? Because if, if it's a, if it's a multiple of revenue and I'm, I'm drastically increasing the revenue of the business, you know, it, it's just a piggy bank that I'm just putting aside, whether it's in my bank account or it's the valuation of the business, I'm still measuring that as return. And that's where you get significant returns is when you yeah. redeploy that. So, so that's interesting. So it's not binary. You're purchasing business so you can increase organic growth. Why is organic growth? What's more important? I mean, it sounds like organic growth is more important. Is that, is that accurate? I think it's, I think it's less expensive, right? That's I mean, organic growth is like less expensive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I almost think we obsess over organic growth. Yeah. I mean, organic growth is the driver, and the, the predictable feature of your business yeah. that you can, one, that makes your business more sellable, uh, makes it worth more, um, also makes it, you know, lenders to be able to lend to you to say, hey, Here's where you are now, and I can reasonably predict where you're going to be in the future. Um, and so we've always just looked at that as, as almost with an obsession Super to say, yeah. you know, it, it, the organic growth outruns attrition in our business. You lose a little bit every year. And if your organic growth doesn't outpace that, then you start to get into declining. And a lot of these agencies that do sell are shrinking businesses, meaning they've hit a point to where they've hit a certain revenue threshold. And by the time that you get called in, that is a declining situation that if they do nothing, 
that business will eventually go to zero. And that's why there's an obsession over yeah, organic, organic growth. Organic growth slows to nothing, and it's like then it's now you've got a melting ice cube. Right? So is there a way I can measure my, you know, what the return of the purchase or what the cost of the purchase is versus my cost of organic growth is? Should I be doing that as a, as a business owner? Should I know you know, should I, should I, yeah. should I, should I measure what I'm willing to pay for a business based upon what my other, you know, what my other options is, which is organic growth? Should I, should I know what that is? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you look at it in, in, uh, payroll and, and towards sales and marketing staff, right? So you can weigh your opportunity cost based upon, okay, here's the outcome I'm looking for. Here's the cash I have and retain earnings. I can either take that and I can hire three producers and what is the predictable uh, mm -hmm. amount that a producer on average within my ecosystem does? Um, let me weigh that against the fact I can spend that cash on an acquisition, which creates cash flow, to then how many producers can I hire with that cash flow, right? And let me, let me run all those numbers throughout. And, you know, another part of this too, Brett, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, who owns a large car dealership, and they, they've done a lot of deals and I, it's always the question of, hey, let's let's make up numbers. Let's let's use round numbers, a million bucks. Hey, if I gave you a million bucks organically, would you know what to do with it? Or if I buy an asset for a million dollars, you know, I know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. So that opportunity cost, I think there's a certain level, certain level for business owners that you go, you know what, over a certain threshold, I don't know. Like, am I going to really hire 15 producers? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, probably not, because from an execution standpoint, that's very challenging for, for most people. Oof, that's a good point. Right? So, but point. I, I, can, I can take that amount of money that 15 producers hiring them, and I could, I could buy an asset with existing equity that creates future cash flow, and then maybe I can hire five producers. Mm -hmm. that, so that's the way I would kind of view it. That's a great thought. The other thing you just, that's really cool. I've never heard that. That's actually a really good uh, thought process because you're right. There's a certain <laughs> threshold of like execution becomes difficult. Like yeah. I've never, this is a different level of, right. of a beast. You just mentioned, you said I can either hire three producers or I can buy the asset and use the cash flow to hire three producers. Look at the distinction between those two. You just executed exactly what you wanted to, except now you're left with an asset that you're paying down every month. So it's like, it's almost like the, the age old uh, defer. It's like, look, hey, you want, I know you want to hire three producers, but if you take that money, buy an asset, execute it, and then use the cash flow, you can have both. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you can get both. Now, that doesn't mean it's not, it, you got to know how to execute these things, right? Like they're not easy, but at the same time, it's a worthy pursuit of trying to figure out how to do it and knowing what season you're in. Because what you just said to me was, I get both, I get both things. Yeah, and I think you just said it doesn't mean they're w we're without risk. I mean, like you said, just keeping the money in retained earnings has risk. That's actually a guaranteed risk that it's going to lose whatever inflation is every single time. So I think you have to weigh that. They're, this they do not always go well. I mean, we have we've bought businesses that were bought prior and have failed, and in that particular case, there was no strategy or ability to grow the current asset. So take the equity piece out of it, take the valuation that you get if you purchase it, and then the next year and the year after that, it's not going to be worth more. Then you just look at a situation that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing too. I'd, I'd love to come back to the, the equity piece is almost like a bonus. You know, I, we, do, we do watch it and we do keep it in regards to as far as our return. But I, I don't, we would never buy a business just to grow our equity right. in, in the business. Like we would just never do that. I, I'm sure there's at scale, like large, large stuff, you know, people do that, like all the PE firms and they do that. But as far as us, we cash flow is everything. Like we're looking for cash flow. And um, if you keep that in mind and you're looking at a deal and you, and you, and you have that type of framework, I just think you get yourself out of trouble. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, you know, the people who are buying houses and they're buying houses to flip houses yes. and they're buying them. They, all they do is measure what the house is worth on Zillow. Mm -hmm. At any point in time, that could change, right? And it's like, now I'm underwater and it's like I'm putting money into this house and someone says, yeah, it's costing me $150 a month, but, but I've got this equity. And right. it's like, well, what would it happen if you just had cash flow from it every month and then you had that? You know, I just think if you look at these deals from a standpoint of, like a cash on cash return. If you want to deploy the money and use it all, I would we would encourage that. That's great. But it, you don't have to. That's an optional thing. If you're getting if you're gaining cash flow from these deals, you'll get yourself out of hot water because to your point, Tay, everything has risk and there's always skeletons in the closet. And there's always stuff always. that you don't know. And that's just part of every single deal. You know, you're not going to know everything when you purchase a, 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 a you know, a deal. Some deals you look back a year ago and you're like, "Man, that was the best one we ever did. That was incredible." 
some of them you're three months in and you go holy shoot what like what did we do here you know yeah i mean we, we, and we and it's been the gambit right we've we've purchased agencies that that have it dialed in and they're a pretty good business it's just you know they're they're in a position where they want to sell, and we've purchased agencies that we don't even have access to a working management system. We just have a OneDrive that doesn't even have customers. So you're you're having to get with the carriers, and you're going to figure out who the customer base is. So I, I, I think that's important about the the risk part. That's why I talk about back to over negotiation. There's just certain things that you're not going to be able to transfer. There's certain things you're not going to find out to until you're in the execution of it. And I feel like we learn something on 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 every single time, uh, whether it's you get to the end, you oh yeah, we you know we want to buy tail coverage, didn't factor that in. That's five grand, whatever it is, um, cost of doing business or 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 what whatever it is, or hey, we we bought it and that carrier is not going to transfer those policies, so now we need to plan on rewriting all these policies. And there's just certain things that you kind of learn throughout the way, and as far as a risk standpoint, yeah. That's great. Well, I'll, I'll say this, you know, maybe we'll do a, an acquisition playbook. That'd be fun. I mean, just X's and O's. Um, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, leave a comment below and let us know if that would be valuable to just say, hey, look, I'm, I'm ready to purchase this and I just don't know how to do this. You know, is there a step-by-step -step process that we should use and think about? And so we have a full process that we've used, what, you know, four times now. Um, and it's worked really well. Obviously, there's a lot of ways to do it and everybody's got a different style, but it is a good framework to say, okay, the unknown's kind of gone. We know exactly what steps to take when we do this. And I think, too, the, the one thing that keep re keeps resonate with, resonating with me when I'm listening to you guys is we've done this five times. We've looked at probably, like you said earlier, we've probably looked at 70, right, or 60 or 70 over the years. It's like, so it's just because it's for sale doesn't mean you should buy it, Amen. Yeah. right? I mean, obviously, you're going to vet the deal. You're going to figure out which valuation process you're going to use, but it's like just because it's for sale. I mean, it's like forcing these things. I think, I mean, I think of some of them that we've been close on that we've walked away from. Yeah. For, for different things. It's like whether it, whether it wasn't a fair deal or it benefited one over the other or the conditions or the potential for the risk or the skeletons was too much. You know, I, I just think that's worthy of, of, of reminding people of as well. It's right? really good. Yeah. It's not just, not just because it's for sale, we're going to buy it. It's really good. Yeah, and I think, you know, what comes to mind, you know, the playbook, I, I think hopefully that's, that's valuable and certainly hope to share that, but also just the discipline of finding your filter, right? We looked at a few of these early on and we developed a filter that before we even looked at a deal, we, we knew which deals would fit that filter. Mm -hmm. Were they perfect deals? Absolutely not. Uh, are they similarly priced deals? Maybe they're different. So, but if we have a filter that we go in, it allows us to be disciplined as a buyer and go, you know what, this doesn't fit the filter. Let's not get distracted because for a little bit there, you start chasing, oh, this one's for sale. Maybe we can make it work. Right. They do a lot of commercial. It's in South, like whatever it is. And you get lost and you go, yeah, but we don't even do a ton of commercial. Should we really chase that? And, you know, they, they have a niche in car dealerships and, and we don't have that niche. So you start, you can get really distracted if you don't predetermine kind of what you do well, what would be exciting to you. Uh, for example, part of our filter before one of these deals is we wanted coastal distribution. So when, when something came in with coastal distribution and fit the other filters, we were all go not having to have the perfect number um, because we, we knew that we could execute on that. Um, and so I would just encourage the listener to play with this idea of three or four things that goes, if I had an agency that would be attractive, what would it look like before that agency becomes available? Great point. Yeah. So good. So good, man. Well, that's great. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll tie it off right there. I want one more question to you guys. We'll, it's a rapid fire. Last one, and then we'll close this out. This has been super valuable, I think. Um, what is the one thing that you've learned through these acquisitions that you didn't know prior to going into them? Mr. Rodder, I'm going to start with you. That it's not automatic that, that everything's going to transfer over. I mean, I thought that would be just an, an, an easy given thing, but you it's mean like the carriers, the carriers, know. right? It's like, I mean, to, to, to have a carrier go, nope, we're not going to, we're not going to honor that. Or we're not going to move that. I'm like, you just bought it. You just bought it. It's like, what are you talking about? Right. It's, so it's, it, it, it kind of triggers the, the rewrite muscle. It's like, oh my God, we got to, we, you know, we got to hurry. We got, we got problem. Mm, um, I, I, I just say that the, the fact that they don't all, all transfer was, was very, very surprising to me. It's a great point because, you, you know, we've had to lean on, I think it's where relationships matter with, with your company representatives um, is to say, hey, you know, are we running a good business? Is this something that um, that you will help us with if, for example, you're buying 
a, a book of business and that particular carrier has a high loss ratio mm -hmm. and carriers aren't thrilled. Sometimes they want to get off the risk and part ways with it. And you have to have conversations based upon future performance right. of saying, Hey, if we acquire this business, we'll be able to do more with you. We have a good law, you know, that those kind of conversations. So those relationships really matter. I would say for me, Brett, if you ask for me is how much you have to follow up to get some of these commissions uh, shifted, you know, a lot of times, you know, that can take up to 12 Years months, later, yeah, 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 12 months, 24 months, sometimes to where, you know, you call Still a carrier, you old email old. a carrier, you send them the buy, sell, you give them everything they need. And it, you'd think that the next month, the commissions are going to show up in your bank account. Um, and for whatever reason, they continue to show up in the agency owners, the seller's bank account. And so one thing we learned is that bank account you need access to. So that seller, you need to be able to be a signer or have access to that bank account. Uh, and that that mailbox where they're receiving those commissions, because they will can no matter what the carrier says, they will continue to get those commissions months and months and months after you've uh, done that buy sell, and you just have to do a tremendous job to follow up and make sure that everything gets over moved over. Just those two comments right there <laughs> are so valuable. I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm nodding here because I'm like, man, this stuff is not intuitive. And you're right. It's just you would think I purchased it, I own it. Right. And hey, Tammy told me it would be moved over 30 days and it's been eight months. Or, or you didn't have a carrier appointment that came with an acquisition and you don't automatically get that appointment. That's yeah. a big that's one. Another one. Yeah. That's a big one. Well, let's do this. We'll do a follow up to this. Maybe we'll do some short clips and we'll do some stuff. Maybe we'll do a playbook. I think this would be super valuable for uh, anybody that's looking to do this or um, any. Some of you may be nodding your head, laughing in your car, listening to this because you've been through it and you know how it goes. Or if you're listening and you're, you know, you're thinking about selling. I mean, you know, drop <laughs> drop us a line. <laughs> that's right. Be happy to. It'd be great, man. We'd love to honor uh, what you built. And so uh, that's like that comes back to the fair deal. We've had a lot of deals that have shown up just because of reputation. That's what you want. You want people to go, hey, I heard you guys treat people right and you guys do it the right way. And so yeah, there's, we, there's no better compliment than that. So. You know, I, I think you saying that it's important because we've actually have agency owners we dealt with refer other agency owners. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had that happen more than once. I mean, obviously, that's an honor. But I think that's at the forefront of these deals. I mean, at the end of the day, they are transactions. There are numbers involved, risk involved, executables involved. But these are two groups of humans that are coming together. And one is spent their blood, sweat, and tears to build something. Another is going to come in and they're going to spend more blood, sweat, and tears to continue to build something. So before we even get started, that human side of it is vital from whether we proceed as a buyer. Because it also says something about what you're going to find in that business mm -hmm. because businesses are run by humans. And depending on how that human has done a thing for the last five years, 10 years, 15 years is going to depend on some of the skeletons you find. Such a great and, you know, we, we, we've had great relationships. We've purchased real estate from people we've, we've acquired and we, we love that man. That fills us up. Yeah. It's, it's more than a transaction. So I think that's important to hit on. Great comment. That's great, man. I'll tell you what, it's like you guys know what you're talking about. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, we'll uh, we'll do a follow up on this, but hey, thanks so much, man. It's been fun. Great episode. Appreciate you. To us.